Hello, welcome. Today our special guest is a director, producer, and actor whose career has spanned over five decades. A man who has enough directing awards to make Steven Spielberg envious. And uh, he's incredible, illustrious, industrious, the special Paul Thomas. Hi. Yeah, hi, how are you doing today? <coughs> I'm at zero. <laughs> Neutral, a good zero. I'm yeah. ready to go up or down. I'm yeah. right here, right now, with you. Okay, well thank you for letting me in your house and let me do this interview. You're welcome. So, first of all, a couple things I want to say, that we have a lot of parallels, we have a lot in common, you know, that you might not have known. Okay. But. Uh, we're both named Philip. That's right. Your real name is Philip Rivera. Yeah. And your real name is Philip Tobis. Yes. Yeah. Philip Charles Tobis. Yeah. And uh, I was born in April. You were born in April. What day? You're the 17th. I'm the 30th. Okay. <laughs> that's that's and, correct. I was born on Easter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's cool. That's keeps cool. Cha keeps changing. Yeah, right. Yeah. And um, another thing is that your father was a big, strong guy. Yeah. My father was very big and very strong yeah. and very dangerous. So was mine. And um, so was I really loved the adult bit movies, you know, and I had heard that you loved the adult movies yourself. Before I did them? Yes. Before I, I, I was in the business? Yeah, I loved adult movies. Right. Uh, I loved going to the adult theaters. Uh, there was no place else to see them, but the adult theaters, unless you set up a little uh, a little projector in your home. So yeah, I loved going to the adult theaters and watch the, the the movies with who was it? John Holmes and Renee Bond, Rick Cassidy. This is the generation before me. Yeah. Uh, there was something, you know, very exciting about going to an adult theater. It was, it was wrong. It was a little nasty, a little forbidden, a little hidden. <clears throat> and that's, of course, when anything sexual to me is best, is when it's at least a little forbidden. Yeah. So we have, those are some of the things we have in common, a lot. And we like making money, because I know you like making money before. I love making money. I don't have to make it anymore. So that was the best part about having money is that I don't have to think about it too much. I don't have to worry about making money. I'm really not very involved in the world of commerce yeah. at all. I'm not very involved in the world of transaction. So, and that's a real pleasure to me. Yeah, especially today, I bet, because it's aggressive out there, you know? Well, I don't know if that it's any more aggressive at all than it used yeah. to be. It's just, you know, it's changed, that the markets have changed, you know. Certainly, the business model has changed, certainly for adult, my God. But I don't have to worry about whether, how many hits I'm getting on the internet. Yeah. I don't have to care and I don't care. So, I'll, if you don't mind, I'd really like to start in the beginning. You know, that's way back. Okay, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> so, like, where were you born? When and where were you born? Wow, that is a, the beginning. <clears throat> I was born in Chicago. In the, in the, the city of Chicago, on Irving Park and Sheraton Road <clears throat> near Wrigley Field in 1950, 49, depending on which day you ask me. And um, I was, I lived in Chicago till I was 10. Then we moved out to Winnetka, a posh suburb of Chicago. And I went to Nutria High School, one of the best high schools in the world. We, we were even aware at the time that it was a, 
an amazing high school. Oftentimes you're not aware that your environment is as exceptional as it is until later on, but we knew that we were gifted and, uh, and that I, went, I, I went to the University of Wisconsin for two and a half years and I quit to do professional stage work and I did professional stage work for <clears throat> 10 years and then I did pornography for 40 years and that'll, that'll about do it. So you're in a posh neighborhood outside of Chicago, Winneka, and it's so you're um, you're growing up kind of rich. You're saying, yeah. My, my father was um, a well-to-do. We did fine. I come from a ridiculously wealthy family, of which Jim Beam Licker and Sarah Lee and General Dynamics, on and on and on, are a part of. My father. Uh, while he had that available to him, he always took the crooked road. Who was it? Was it? Was it Walt Whitman? I'm not sure. Was it take the road least traveled? He would not only take the road least traveled. He would look for the bumpy crooked road when he could have had a much smoother straight road. So, uh, no matter what he did, real estate. Um, selling boiler plates and toilets, <laughs> he found a crooked way to do it, in which he thought it would be easier and he'd make more money. And in the end, I'm sure that <clears throat> his hesitation to join the mainstream, the mainstream of his family, of his big time family, caused him a lot of problems, a lot of trouble. But I, he was just, I, I have wonderful, loving memories of him. You take. Ralph Cramden and the Honeymooners, combine them with uh, Randy Dangerfield, and that's my dad. Big personality? Big personality. Yeah, big personality. Uh, and not only was, did he find it incumbent upon him to take the bumpy road, he would need to share it. What I mean was, if he would have He spent the years of 63 to 66 in his life in jail because he was uh, accused, convicted of burning down a building, paying someone else to burn down the building, arson. And he denied it, but he did it. When I was a kid, he used to take me by buildings that he would own, and there had been a fire there. And he'd go, oh, Phil, look, it burned down again. And I knew. <laughs> And he knew that I knew he knew. And it wasn't enough that he engaged in this. He had to tell me. He would have an affair on my mother with a friend of the family, a checkout girl. And it wasn't enough that he was a horn dog and had a, an affair. He had to share it with me. Somehow he'd. he'd well, you let me know, hey, you know, a blank, blank friend of your mom's, whew, does <laughs> she sweat? Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, but he was consistent. <laughs> he always did it. <laughs> and my mother left him, which she should have done, when she was about 50, after 25 years of marriage. And, uh, I think the following might encapsulate my upbringing with him. We lived in a beautiful house on the lake in Chicago, outside of Chicago, gorgeous area. The faucets never worked. The kitchen cabinets never closed. <clears throat> While the neighbors would be driving Cadillacs, my father, who might have had 50,000 bucks in cash in his pocket. Maybe that's a bit much, but he had wads and wads and wads of cash. He would drive a, a Renault Dauphine 
tiny little car with dents in it. And he was six foot four, 280 pounds. He'd be driving um, Ramblers. Uh, he, well, he bought a Mercedes one day, but it was a used old diesel Mercedes. And he could have afforded anything he wanted to, but he did not drive that. And when we would go to relatives parties, could be Jewish High Holidays, Yom Kippur, Passover, and all my relatives would be pulling up in uh, the finest of the finest. Uh, he'd drop us off in our little beat up Mercedes. We'd walk in, he'd park down the street. And I asked him one day, why are you doing this? Why are you driving this whole beat up car? Is you going to afford? I don't know, Phil, it's just the way I roll. I can't help it. You don't like it, get out. <laughs> Really? And, um, I get out. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I love it. I mean, he's keeping it real. He's keeping it real. And when I run into, I don't have that much to do with my f f family, who I know mostly cousins. Some very nice people. But uh, first of all, when I became Paul Thomas, I probably, uh, it's not so much that they ostracized me. I ostracized myself. You know, what am I, I'm going a very different route here. And most of them, I just didn't have time or the interest going to a cousin's wedding or Passover dinner at my aunt's. But I also created a wall there that maybe they don't like me. Maybe they don't approve of me, which maybe they didn't. But I didn't even give them the chance to disapprove of me. I removed myself fairly much. So, um, when I occasionally run into my cousins, which I do occasionally, and my father comes up, they have they just loved him. They recognize how very, very different he was than their relatively straight-laced parents, relatively conservative parents, and here comes Uncle Stan, he's coming over, we're gonna have fun for today. So, um... Did your father give you a lot of love? Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember in what form. I mean, just, it was very laissez-faire. I was allowed to do whatever I want to. I, I never remember my parents saying no to anything. Um, always there, never wanted for anything, ever. Sure. It showed me a lot of love just in the, I'm not sure we were a huggy, kissy family, but my father was always there for me. My mother too. Well, you seem very mellow always, every time I've ever talked to you, spoke with you, and worked for you. But, so I'm, did he ever whoop your ass? Because he's a big, strong guy? Never. No. Wow. He didn't, after you get close to him, he would just yell. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Philip! I, I didn't like the name Philip growing up. No? It's a, it's a heavy name, Philip. Oh, your name's Philip. Fuck you. Your name's Philip. Okay. <laughs> Did you like the name Philip growing up? Well, the truth is that my um, father's name was Philip. Okay. So then my middle name is Troy. So they used to call me Troy. Okay. You know, so I didn't get to hear, but I like Philip. So when I moved away, I told everybody to call me Philip, just like my father. Okay. So I kind of liked it because my father was Phil, Phil, you know, Philip, whatever. But he was a cool guy, so I always... Looked at him like <clears throat> he was the big badass, cool ass, womanizer, <laughs> and all that good stuff. Money maker, you know, roughneck. Womanizer. Yeah, well, he just loved the women. My dad did too, and so did I, and that's not a good thing. I've come to believe, to yeah. know. Being a womanizer usually means you're a liar. Right? Probably. Not all the time, but usually? Come on, yeah. let's be honest here. Did you're lying to someone. Not all the time. I mean, I, 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 was, I was going to be a swinger. I was a swinger. Open relationships. Everyone would know the truth. Everyone would know the truth. And poly, what do they call it now? Polyamory. Uh, but it, basically a swinger. I was in the, very big into the swinging movement of the 70s. And, and lying about your various love affairs I'm being generous, calling them love affairs, one night stands, whatever they were, to 
whoever was your primary woman in your life. Which usually being a womanizer entails. Being a womanizer usually entails being kind of chauvinistic. Not cool. Fuck us for doing it. Not cool. Fuck me for doing it. I'm sorry to every woman I ever lied to. It's not good. But it's such a fucked up sexual world that God created. You know, we're not monogamous. But you can't tell the truth. But it's not cool. And we're hunters. We're liars. I don't mean, uh, yeah, w yes, we're hunters. We're liars. If we can't look at the, if there's 10 women in our lives or five, and we can't look at them if we lie to them in order to, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're not always that way. You can have open relationships, but it usually doesn't come down that way for really sexual people like us. I have a lot of friends who have never lied to their wives, but there's also, also never strayed. They're not sexual like we are. So our challenge, as I saw it going into the 70s, the 1970s, not my 70s, going into the 70s, was to maintain my extremely sexual nature and tell the truth about it. And tell the truth about it. And I started that way, but I slowly gravitated into you know, the, the bullshit of the 60s and 70s, uh, lying. Yeah, you know, I understand exactly what you're saying, but then I think we have to look at this point, just to try to level it out or even it out a little bit. Certain men, certain body types are not created equal, A, we know that. Mm -hmm. But the sex drive on certain people are not equal. So if you're blessed or cursed, whatever way you want to call it, with a big libido or you're just a macho man and you have to fuck everything in sight because that's the way you're made. Mother Nature made you that way and society says, no, you don't do it that way. A, B, your girlfriend that you care about, you don't care about every girl. Right. You know, it's rare you find one, two, three girls that you really, really get along with and bond with so perfectly and love and you love their smile and their ass everything works perfectly so how and why would you want to lose this and you're created as a beast you know with wild blood how what you know what do you think you're supposed to do you think you cannot you cannot do it it's not i tried it i tried it and i felt like i was coming off of heroin i don't do heroin but i'm guessing that's what it might have been i was going in convulsions, sick to my stomach, and I said, whoa, this is, this is heavy. So, on that defense, don't feel bad, because that's the way you were created, as a wild beast. You're a very mellow guy, but you must have barbarian blood in you. You gotta tell the truth. I have to tell the truth. For the people, to the people, I mean, you can look at a woman you care for, your wife, your girlfriend, say, look, at I, I, I can't be monogamous, I'm going to, I'm going to stray. And I'm not going to share it with you because I don't want to hurt you. And don't ask me because I'm not going to tell you the truth. I guess if you have that conversation with your woman, that's authentic, that's cool. But come on, we know when we hurt someone. We should, that's the challenge, you know. That's the way I roll, actually. Okay, you know beautiful. What I mean? I said, don't ask me, and I won't disrespect you. Okay, beautiful. And that, that's yeah. where I try to roll, but I wasn't always consistent with it. You know, but I, I, I tried to. But. It's, you know, with somebody you care about, it's just very difficult. And you're going to, no matter what, you go back 40 years ago, you're still, with all the information you know now, you're still going to be the same guy. That's I'm the, the same guy now. I just, I just don't need to have it. Yeah. I, 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 that's what I was saying before, is that, and I don't say this with any sadness, what I'm about to say. I'm not saying this as a man who has lost something. I'm saying this as a man who has gained something, is that I don't require, even crave, sex with another person now. Man, woman, midget, 
I was going to say child. I won't say child. <laughs> I, uh, I don't want, I don't require sex with other person. Now it's, it's not that good. And let, I, this is what I started to say before. And I don't feel that as a loss. I've had sex with so many people in so many situations. I've done it. If I haven't had her, I've had someone just like her. And I know that's true for you too. And I don't feel that as a loss. That is a peace that's in my life. That's wonderful. All of the complications that sex brought into my life aren't there anymore. And one of the complications, one of the main reasons that sex brought such complications into my life is because I was always accompanied by drugs. Always. I never had sex without drugs. When you used to, let's go back to LSD in the 60s, when you used to having sex on LSD for 18 hours and the room is changing colors and her breasts are bigger than uh, Gibraltar and, and you come for hours and 18, to, you know, were you supposed to go down? And then it was uh, MDA and then ecstasy and speed and cocaine and everything else, all the drugs that at least for a while, enhance sex. After a while, they do the opposite. But how are you supposed to come down from an evening in ecstasy, you know, with uh, three different girls? And how are you supposed to come from that to just a nice, quiet evening with a woman you love, maybe a t and making soft, quiet love for half an hour? It's boring. It's, it's not, it's better than a sharp stick in the eye, but it's nothing to go out of your way for. So at this point in my life, when I've had thousands of people, I, I'm not compelled to have sex with people anymore. And thank God, the more important people in my life are not compelled to do it either. So it's a freedom. I have less energy than I used to have anyway, but the energy that I have now I can put into other things, and I don't do drugs anymore. Much. I was gonna bring some cocaine too. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I wouldn't even. It would tempt me, but I don't. Those are the drugs I don't touch anymore. The, most of the drugs I've listed that are really good for sex have a a speed element to them, be it cocaine or LSD or I don't touch that stuff anymore. I really don't. So it goes together. I don't do the drugs, I don't do the sex. And it's a good trade-off. I'm happy about that. You know, to be 70, really? 75, 80 and still fucking like a bunny seems to me a waste, if not a waste, an expenditure of a lot of energy that I need. I need all the energy I can get for <clears throat> other things in life. Do you exercise? Yeah. Well, since we're done here, I'm going to exercise. Gotta, so I think that's what I have to do. I'm a, a trainer, a class. I had cancer uh, four years ago now. Right, right here. Wow, oh, I see. There's a, a slight indentation yeah. and hook to my nose. A little more Jewish from this side than this side. Oh, yeah. Nice Roman straight nose. I, got a little bit. I had cancer here, and they opened this up three times. Took a, took a big old squamous tumor for under that. And um, I'm good now. When they did, they had to sever something, something called the trigeminal nerve in my face, which is the main nerve. So I have a neuropathy. Do you have any nerve problems ever? Nerve problems can give you. It's, it's my a severed trigeminal is listed as one of the greatest pains. I, I could show you right now on your computer. It's listed as one of the greatest pains you can have. I don't experience it that way, but I do need to quiet it with Lyrica. And there's a drug, and Lyrica makes you tired. So I have to guard and parcel out my energy in ways that I didn't used to do. There it is right there, it's right 
So I hear you. So you, do you think that if you didn't have that, you would still have more, a lot more energy? I think that I would have more energy. I still don't think that I would go back to fucking a lot because I don't want to do drugs anymore. Without drugs, I don't want to fuck. Without fucking, I don't want to do drugs. And I mean drugs. I don't mean bullshit drugs like marijuana or occasional, you know, Percocet. I don't mean that. I mean drugs. <laughs> Heavy. Heavy, yeah. Drugs and sex are great. Come on. They are. When it works. When it works. Oh, yes. Yeah, it doesn't drugs. always work. When it works, when the ecstasy is in the right place and you got your favorite people around and you got uh, totally engaged. For, for, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm serious. And, like for eight hours, you know, it's amazing. Everything else pales in comparison. Unless, I guess, people would say, well, Philip, Paul, whatever my name is, what about the connection of the soul? What about just matching with someone and having a quiet connection of the soul and loving someone? Loving someone. To me, love and sex never had anything to do with one another. Really don't. Do they do you? It's, um, it, it would be... Almost gets in the way. It's, it's yeah, it, it was a turn off maybe. Well, it's, I, I mean, I don't say, I love you, let me stick my dick in your cunt. I love you, let me, but, but that's my, twist and maybe yours too maybe that's why we're in this business there are people that say I, I've missed a soul connection a love connection and perhaps I have I've perhaps I have because to me again saying I love you and I want to fuck you are completely different things and one thing is not only does it have anything to do with each other they're kind of Polar opposites. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. Let me on the horny uh, idea of the wildness. Yeah, it, the kinkiness is taken away. Yeah, it doesn't have to be. I really said that might probably be a shortcoming of mine, but I made up for it in other areas. Okay. No, I mean, no, I've heard that numerous times. Sometimes you only want to fuck the one you love. <laughs> yeah, and that, that's a. Uh, I, I, women probably experience it too, that they can, they can exercise a passion with someone who they're not deeply in love with more so. A quick affair, but it's more a male thing, and it's a weakness. I, I think that women are superior to men, more mature, more consistent. They can experience love and lust for the same person. In fact, loving you will increase their lust. Um, I think they're more truthful. I think they're uh, they're higher, they're on a higher rung of human uh, evolution than men. I really do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm still young and chauvinistic, so so it's, I guess I still want to stay back in that neighborhood of you know your youth. You know, so. Uh, Go back to that, revisit that. So you're, um, you always seem to me like you had a hell of a vocabulary, a vast vocabulary. And I wonder, how did you get that great vocabulary? You sort of discern where your strengths are. And you develop it. I mean, I couldn't screw a leg into a table. I can barely put in a light bulb. But my brother could build a house. But I recognized early on that I had a, a, a mind that I had a good book. I, I had a good grasp of the language, and uh, <clears throat> I was pretty good at expressing it. So I, I developed that. So I I, I I I recognize new words, and I try to use them where appropriate. And and. I have a huge ego. I, my ego is just ridiculous. I don't, you never, one really never knows if one's ego is bigger than someone else's. How do you know? You, people, you know, see someone's ego. So 
my ego may not really be bigger than other people's, but it feels to me like I've got a big ego. Even at almost 70 years old, I walk into a room and I think the 20-year-old girls are flirting with me. I think all the men want to be me. What do I like to say? By myself, I'm as fucked up as anyone else. By myself, I've got all sorts of self-doubts and recriminations that go on. And I say all sorts of things that don't make any sense. And, but when I'm in a room full of people, I almost always feel like a king. Like, and it shouldn't, even, like I'm the one with the most, the biggest dick and the most shit that I have together and the most money and I'm the most admired and I have the best singing voice and I'm the one that people want to listen to and everyone wants to talk to me and what I say are golden nuggets. It's ridiculous. It's not true. I know it's not so. I know it's not so. I'm just a schmuck like everybody else. But when I'm not, when I just... Walk, let my mind go freely. That's what first comes to me when I walk into a room. I think everybody's looking at me in an admiring way. And even at almost 70 years old, I, I really do. I think it's ridiculous. Out in the restaurant, I'll think that all the young girls, 25, 35, are flirting with me. They don't even see me. <laughs> they don't even see me anymore. <laughs> Uh, but they seen you a lot for a long time. Yeah, yes they did. So uh, let's go back to that. So then you're in school, and you're how tall were you? How tall are you right now? Six two. Six two. So in school and high school, right? Yeah. Or when did you first start noticing the girls looking at you? Always. 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 That's where you got the ego from. Well, I don't know what comes first. I mean, they go together, you know. Yeah. Well, sometimes it seems like it would feed you to have a big ego, so they fed you. It, it, one supported the other. Mm -hmm. if, if, I was, if I wanted a girl, I got her. Um, I don't know what came first, the ego or the conquest, or I, 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 they go together. You need the ego to even attempt it. Most importantly, it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter. As far as, as far as... Oh, I don't mean it doesn't matter if I've made love to this woman or not, or if I've... I don't mean to put everything in sexual terms because it's not. I don't mean that... The point I want to get across, when did you say, I love these girls looking at me, I love the way this round girl's ass looks, or you saw this outline of her fat vagina in her bikini, or something that made you say, you know, because when I was younger, you know, my brain would go crazy. When did that start affecting you? Uh, you know. How old? A, a, a 10. 10? Maybe 10. But this, I didn't lose my virginity until I was about 18. Yeah, 17 maybe, so. Wow. No, so I was just a normal kid, I think. Well, more, far more highly sexed than most kids, yes, but not, I wasn't out of the box. I was still within reason. So, oh, okay. So, eight, so, wow, 17, 18, that's pretty, that's pretty um, slow for a guy of your stature and your uh, accomplishments in sex, you know, today. So let's say, in between that, 10 years old and 17, you were kissing the girls, you were kissing the boys. You, I mean, tell me, my, my uncle told me a story the other day that was very common in New York for the boys to like boys. Sure. He said he was under a car with a boy while the cars drove by. I mean, crazy stuff. So, yeah, please uh, um, let me know. The sex took the form of, I'd play around with my boyfriends, you know. We'd, one of us would pretend we were a girl, and we would fuck, but you know, we'd play with each other, stuff like that, innocent stuff, just because the girls weren't going anywhere those days, we couldn't have them. But that faded away, and I was with girls, you know, first, second, third base, hand jobs. I remember one girl in high school, 
she wouldn't. I couldn't touch her down there, but she'd stick her finger in my ass. You know, she, we were just like French kissing, and I couldn't even feel her tits, but she'd stick her finger in my ass. Honest to God. Wow. I don't remember her name, I'm not going to say it, but I remember reaching. How old were you, you said? I was probably 16. Oh, wow. I reached for her tit, slapped my hand. She put her hand down my pants. I thought, oh, crap, she got a hand job. No, she went, but she stuck her finger in my ass. And that wasn't bad either. But I realized it was not the progression of events that I expected uh -huh. <laughs> at all. <laughs> I mean, so was she was pretty? Oh, yeah, they're okay. all pretty. I'm guessing that, you know, the pretty girls liked you. They're all pretty. All the young girls are pretty. But yeah, she was very pretty. You know, some are more sure. pretty than others. She was all very, very pretty. But course. you couldn't even touch her tits, but she's giving you a hand job? Yeah, not a hand job. No, oh, she just stuck a finger up my ass. <laughs> finger banging you. Yeah, <laughs> she was just finger banging me. <laughs> so she was a, a woman of today. <laughs> if that's what women of today are like, yeah. Yeah, well. I mean, you know, it's strong, a lot stronger and more outspoken. But, um, she had a mind of her own. So, all right, so that sounds uh, strange. Any, any other stories? I know there's a wild story that I heard, you know, about a dentist. Oh, my dentist. <laughs> my dentist. Yeah, my dentist, and I was a, my orthodontist when I was a kid. I would be in my chair and he would move up against my hands with his crotch. And I'd leave my hands there, somehow perversely exciting. He used to begin scheduling me for the final, the final uh, episode, the final apartments in his day. So there'd be no one there. And uh, anyway, I'm not going to get, he taught me to masturbate. He taught me to masturbate, and in back in his room with all the teeth. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I, I, I'm going to say this right on air here. I mean, my my my, my other dentist taught me to masturbate. There's was, was a room back full of teeth. I look around, there's the teeth. When I, he wouldn't let me come, he'd make me put my finger between my legs so I wouldn't ha I wouldn't spew an orgasm and sperm all over his teeth. Um, I, I've, just like you have, and just like many people, I've had an amazing amount of sexual exploits that are <clears throat> entertaining. So I'm always interested in the girls and, you know, I mean, the girl stories because that's what I always loved girls and that's why I got into business, you know, so I always want to hear girl stories. So tell me about your first time. That's worth, that's worthwhile. My first time was uh, on screen, you mean? No. Oh, not that's great. Yeah, because you told me. My first time. 18. My first time was with a uh, an overweight summer girl. They call them the girls that come and be a maid for a family in the summer in uh, Chicago, outside of Chicago, where I lived. And that guy, she was a uh, from Minnesota, and she. Uh, it was kind of well known that she would do it. A couple of my friends, I think, had had her. I don't remember exactly. I had a motorcycle, a Honda 150. I went and picked her up. We took a ride. She reached around me and was giving me a hand job while we were riding the motorcycle by the lake. And that was unusual. I was 16 years old, just turned 16. And we went back to her attic apartment in the house she took care of. and. Um, we fucked. Uh, it was better than a sharp stick in the eye, but where was the ecstasy? Was <laughs> really? Even, even then? then? Even then I felt, okay, this is cool, this is nice, but this is not that different than masturbation. I was all right. It was, uh, I remember the main thing that stands out is I remember I had an erection and even after I came I still had an erection and 
we used my erection to hang a towel from. I don't know, remember she was washing her. She needed a place to hang a towel, so I said, yeah, hang it here. Oh, that's quite a bit to remember. Yeah. And she wasn't that pretty. No. Uh, but I remember other first times close to that, third, fourth, fifth times, with girls whose names I remember were beautiful. And that was far more exciting. And you felt fulfilled, or you still felt like, where's the drugs? No, I felt fulfilled. I loved them. Puppy love, and they loved me, and it was exciting and hot. Wonderful. I'm probably overselling the drugs. The drugs, as of about hmm, 23 years old, probably 24, just about the time I started poor. Drugs and sex were one. Up until I started porn, I had plenty, a lot of sex, but it wasn't always entwined with drugs. But once I started porn, there was so much sex. I got involved with drugs. Originally, it was the Mitchell brothers and cocaine. You know who the Mitchell brothers are? Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. yeah I, was, it, I was to go there with Alex Dorenzi. That's right. Alex didn't have drugs, but the Mitchell brothers did. It was cocaine and the, and the Mitchell brothers. It was uh, my, my first big movie was for them called uh, The Autobiography of a Flea actually, and the girl starring opposite me was named Janine Jennings, a and a beautiful blonde girl. I took her back to my house in Sausalito, and, like m almost all the time, whether it be her or Jane Hamilton, who you know, you know. I, well, how was Jane Hamilton? Excellent. If you, you know, took her home, it had to be something. Yeah, I took her, took them all home, though. Uh, yeah, that's And uh, uh, Jean Jennings, her boy, it turned out, people would say, you better be careful, her boyfriend's mobbed up. Well, if you ever saw The Godfather, her boyfriend's in The Godfather. He was an actor, a mob sort of actor, and he was mobbed up. Uh, nothing can, you know, I can, I've created a legend around that, but I told you today I was going to be authentic, so I'm not going to lie. That was it. <laughs> Cool. You know, that, that, my, my, that was my first big film as an actor, my first big X-rated film. I'd done big films before that weren't X-rated. But, and uh, the autobiography of a flea, and I remember being in the dressing room of the O'Farrell Theater. You know O'Farrell? Of course. And in walks John Holmes, who I was a fan of from being, going to X-rated movies when I was 16, 17 years old. And uh, he's taking his clothes off in the corner, and I'm catching a glance at the fonts. Oh my God! It's like the Grand Canyon. You, you see, you hear something for so long, it's so big, uh -huh. and you see it, and it's actually bigger. <laughs> it was fucking amazing. Really? Yes. Yes. How big is that? You think? I don't know, like this. Whatever. <laughs> I mean, huge. Yeah, because there's a guy in the business I, I worked next to and I shot was Mandingo. Right, Mandingo. He's, he's pretty damn big. Yeah. Is that the same size as home? I think it would look bigger because he's white. Uh huh. A Mandingo, you almost expect it. Because a lot of blacks were ridiculous cocks. <laughs> you almost, but on a white guy, a skinny white guy. Uh huh. Yeah. So was it the same size as Mandingo or a little smaller? You think? I would think a little bigger. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Wow, and white wild. looks bigger than black anyway. I mean, just the color. Yeah, 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 right, of course. Right? It makes, it makes look bigger. Yeah. You know, if someone wants to look thin, they wear black. Uh-huh. You don't, if, you, if you're worried about looking fat, you don't wear white, right? Right, right, of course. So. No shit, so, so they look bigger. <clears throat> <I think so. laughs> yeah. Oh, back to the wild stories. Uh, I guess we'll go back and forth, but then I had heard, you know, wild stories about you, and I know you haven't discussed this one, because this is a secret one. Tell me. All right. I didn't know I had any secrets. <laughs> they had, I think this is probably about 91 or 92 I had heard this, that F.M. Bradley, you called F.M. Bradley in the middle of the night and told him to come over to your house and get the hell over here right away because you wanted to hang out with him. Field Marshal Bradley. That, that's not true. No? 
I mean, you could say, that if, if I had invited him over to come and fuck me in the ass, I'd tell you. Yeah. I, did, I didn't. No. I didn't, never spoke to Field Marshal Bradley in my life. Yeah. But I might have done something when I was high. I, and I even remember it. But I, no, I wouldn't have. I don't have the slightest recollection of that. Okay. Not the slightest. Yeah, you know how the business is. Sometimes you hear a lot of bullshit. Right. But that's what I had heard, one of the stories. No, no. What's another one you heard? Well, of course, the ones that, that I want to talk about, of course, that you were, you know, Jay used to always, you know, <laughs> talk shit, you know, Jay, Jenna, yeah. Jay Gardena, you would always say, wow, PT's waking up in, in, a, in somebody's house today or tomorrow, you know, or, oh. or breaking into somebody's house buck naked, eating their food. That happened. <laughs> that happened, yeah. Uh, yeah, that happened. It was... Uh, but when I worked with, did it happen during the time I worked with Jenna? Might have. Had I was pretty, be. I would get high. I, I lived, <clears throat> with, I was with my wife for 15 years, 15 years. And then I was alone in a great big home I owned, still own it, Santa Monica, for the next 10 years. Now I'm back with my wife. And during those 10 years, half of them were spent with a girl named Anita Rinaldi. Remember her? I heard the name, but it was before my time. A little, not, my, not really. No? Not at all. Not at all. This was 2000, 2005. Anita Rinaldi? No. Come on. I have to look this up, man. Anita Rinaldi. No, I mean, of course, that's my time. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, she was. I, I I split up with my wife for a good number of years to be with Anita, and she, Anita lived in Europe. So when we worked together, I was on my own here, and I got in a lot of trouble. I did uh, too many drugs, and I went wandering the streets at night, looking for I don't know what. Walking? Walking. Cre around Santa Monica, you were saying? Around Santa Monica, creeping. There's a better word for it. Creeping around in my creepy way of drugs and looking to rape someone or be raped. <laughs> More probably be raped under a tree someplace. <laughs> I, n I, I never found it because I didn't think I really wanted to find it. One night I wandered into someone's house and I wandered into their room, bedroom. They could have shot me legally. It was two in the morning. I was six foot two, a big dildo, a kimono. Why did you have the dildo? Any reason? What is reasons? Huh? I like dildos. <laughs> and, uh, you like to use them, you mean? Yeah. Okay. And um, they told me to go downstairs. Please get out of their room, and I did. And I went downstairs and I sat in the living room for like an hour. Obviously, I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. I was just so screwed up. I was screwed up. You know, that, and the cops came and I was arrested and I was put in jail for six months for um, trespassing. And I was, got, and then that happened twice more. But those times I was treated as someone who was sick and needed treatment. And I got the treatment. I wasn't cured, but I was never caught again. I never did it again. I didn't wander anymore. Did you ever say to yourself that you wanted to be cured? Yeah. Say, God help me because I'm a maniac a little bit? Um, not a maniac, I wouldn't say a maniac, but you know, wild. You know, it's such, it's so, the normal course of events is you do something like that, you get high and you party and you, and then you regret it. And you express regrets. I don't feel that way. 
I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't, I shouldn't have walked into someone's house. No doubt about it. Wrong. Bad. Bad Philip. But I never hurt anybody. I never had the slightest intent of hurt. And I never really approached people. I understood how. But, but drugs were so much fun. You've done drugs, right? Yeah. Drugs are so much fun to be in that space. There's a reason you go to that space, and there's a reason you go back, because it feels mentally, spiritually, physically, sexually so good. So then to come down off of it and to, to, to condemn it, I just think it's a, it's a hypocrisy. Uh, you can't keep doing it because it's not healthy. You'll die. But for the times you do it, and it can ruin your life. It absolutely can ruin my life. And if I hadn't, uh, if I'd been in another walk of life, it would have ruined my life. At least the, the business part of it, the relationship part of it. So rather than Oh my God, I had drugs, I walked around, I did parties, I fucked uh, men and women and midgets and Italians. <laughs> um, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Fuck that. Own it. I'd rather say, I did drugs and I partied and I fucked men and women and midgets and Italians and it was so good. I loved it all night long. Oh my God, it was good. And it's over. And I own it. Yeah, I mean, I, I can understand what you're saying. Why not own it? I mean, I can afford to own it now. I'm independent. I don't. Mm -hmm. I made amends with my wife, and we're good, and, you know, I've got plenty of money. I don't have to worry about the world supporting me or some boss calling. But, but even Vivid Video doing the 10, they were so understanding. I'm sure they were so understanding. Steve, and, Steve was so understanding. Yeah, yeah. He was so understanding because he had had drug problems. So uh, to say drug problems, I hate that word. Right. Drug problems. He did drugs and then he stopped. You did something you liked, so yeah, what? I did something I liked, I had a great time. I had, a, like everyone else, I had some trouble getting off of it when I wanted to, but eventually I did. I had drug pleasures but they're not sustainable for too long and you have to stop and that's the problem. To, but to get into the morals or the ethics of it, the ethics and the morals would be if you hurt someone else. Walking into someone's home is wrong. Lying to you, uh, someone is wrong, <laughs> you know, but it's not so much fun. So many sexual feelings that most people never have. You know, sex isn't always just two souls melding together in the atmosphere of love and then going to sex and also, also sex, drugs and rock and roll and screaming and yelling and staying up all night. And so you still have a barbarian in your blood. At the blood it expressing the barbarian yeah. within you and then when it's over, what, what, what some of the, the, the doubts and recriminations come because the downside of drugs, you've been there, is uncomfortable. You can get mentally, physically, spiritually sick. You work your way through it. You work your way through it and you come out and you're okay again. And then when you're okay again, why not say, I had a great time. Oh my God, I'm just done. I can't do it anymore. And go, I'm sorry, I did horrible things, you know. I think it's society, right? Society makes you... Well, it's, it's because people are dependent on society yeah. to make a living, to, to, their fam to be loved by their families. What little family I have left love me for everything that I am, not despite the things that I am not or... And it's not part of me. I'm, as I'm sitting in the, in the old days, I might have been saying this to you and said, I got to go, because I'd go out and get wild. But I'm, it's not part of me anymore. 
and I don't go. It's not like, oh, it's not part of me anymore, I'm old, I can't, no. It's not part of me anymore and it's great. Yeah. So you don't miss it? No. Okay. Once in a while, yeah. yeah. But I'm not tempted to <laughs> it go It doesn't there. creep in the back of your brain like oh, yeah. the but, old days. Yeah, but not much. Middle of the night, hey, this might be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that all the time, but I don't. <laughs> right? And your heart is as you start having little fantasies in your head. Well, this, this, and this together equals what I want. <laughs> and and I, I wouldn't look as good walking around in a thong bikini and heels <laughs> now as I used to. So, don't want to do that. Oh, you look like you're still in good shape. You're not out of shape, so. Yeah, I'm fine. Congratulations on that. Yeah, trust me, your body doesn't look the same at 70 as it does at 50. You, even yours won't. And you being in good physical shape is a prime part of your existence. Yeah. Yeah. My grandpa, I remember him cornering one of my father's secretaries in the office at 75. He was strong, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but in any case, he went, he, I don't think he ever did drugs, but... Yeah, but his tits sagged at 75, too. His tits? Oh, yeah, no. I mean, yeah. Probably. He's around the mouth, but yeah. He had strong legs, but probably tits were sagging. But um, I guess I heard one time, maybe you heard the same idea. I think it was Plato or Socrates that said, that, you know, they're finally older and they yeah. finally weren't so interested in having sex all day. And he said, finally, I can relax and think about life. Yeah. 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 So. So back to the business, because for me, the business was something so exciting for me, you know, being an actor in the business. For me, it was unbelievable getting in the business, making my way. And one time, the first time I met you, it was 1990 in the little office over there in Van Nuys, you know, Vivid. And I walked in your office, and I said, it's Pete Paul Thomas, you know, it's cool, right? And he had a a box cover of Deidre Holland, I'm pretty sure it was there, or a magazine cover. And I said, wow, that girl's pretty hot, man. She's hot. But you just looked at him and said, oh, <laughs> big fucking deal. <laughs> oh, I, didn't f I might have said that, but I didn't feel that. But Deidre was very hot. Yeah. Exceptionally hot. Yeah. Deidre Holland, Nikki Dial. Nikki Dial, you liked? Oh, a lot of them. Yeah, they're beautiful, beautiful girls. They used to call me Uncle Creepy. Oh yeah, because you're trying to <laughs> grab them or what? Not much, no. not much, no. I, I never tried to grab any girls. I'd make them, seriously. I, yeah, I when, when people would ask me these days, did I have any problems with sexual abuse? I would make the girls come to me. I, maybe you did that. I, I wouldn't, I wasn't aggressive with women. I would yeah. make myself attractive enough to them so that they would be aggressive with me, which was the only way I enjoyed it anyway. Then I'd get my, I'd get it on them, but they had to make the first move. I guess. No, I, I and the you. second move, and yeah. then I'd take over. And when I saw you on the set, you're always just very quiet, very subdued, very focused. Yeah. Right? So, here you are, I guess you're on Jesus Christ Superstar, and they're in, you're in the Beach Blanket Babylon, the longest running a musical in the history of America. With the thing is, 6.5 million people have seen the show, with 17,000 showings. I'm pretty sure it said, and um, and so you're over there, and the Mitchell brothers come up to you, and uh, they were holding auditions for uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's big budget, half million dollar actually the movie Sodom and Gomorrah. And I was doing legitimate stage work, like you said, Beach Break in San Francisco. And I went over to them and I was about to audition for them and met them. And I changed my mind. I didn't do it. But I said, look, I'm in this show. Why don't you come and see it one day? And they did. I got to know them that way. And then... <clears throat> Both but, brothers? Yeah. Jim and Artie. They were tight? Friendly? I mean... Yeah. I know they killed each other, but I'm just curious. Well, one killed the other. Yeah. Well, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were tight. I'm sure they loved each other a lot. And uh, became friendly with them. 
Because these were the days when, you know Hunter Thompson is? Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Yeah. The, the original gonzo journalist, Hunter Thompson. He was in the crowd too. Um, and I became friendly with the crowd. It was a cool crowd to hang out with. Great cocaine. They came and saw my show. And then eventually they did another really big budget. The Autobiography of a Flea. And that's... Uh, so, so they were basically were looking at talented actors? Is that the idea? Who could and would. Fuck. Yeah. Who could, yeah. who could. Yeah, and I had this major, I had a, a couple of major credits to my name. Just in the past couple of years of major Broadway shows. Major. And it was unheard of. They would look at me, what are you doing here? What the fuck, you know, what are you doing here, man? But that served me um, perhaps more more than it should have. You know, I was, uh, it was addicting suddenly being the biggest, I was, you know, I was a mega star in pornography immediately because the things that I had done, the people not being, well, what's this guy doing here? And, and, and there's that ego of mine again. And I, I didn't have the dedication or discipline that it took to stick out mainstream. Uh, I just... Because... I, yeah. I, I was with the best agent in Hollywood, William Morris Agency. And I had finished two or three of the biggest credits in the world. Oh. Jesus Christ Superstar? I mean, I don't know which one Hair. It is. The Hair. show Hair. Yeah. The, fi the film Hair? The, 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 this, this Broadway play. But, okay. And, and uh, uh, some other things. And, and uh, it came time to buckle down, study, stay with my agent, let him work with me, learn my craft, learn my craft, learn my craft. And uh, I didn't show the discipline necessary to do that. And said someone was saying, here, we'll give you a thousand dollars a day. Here's this great big great script you can do. You can fuck these beautiful women. Um, and everyone around me saying, that's cool. Do that. That's great. Not everyone. A lot of people. Well, it becomes reality by agreement. I'm in the X-rated world. Everyone around me telling it's cool. I'm in San Francisco where the sexual revolution is at its height. There's very few forces telling me not to do it, other than William Morris Agency. Well, you asked them? No, but I knew. Well, yeah. And funny. I had friends and have friends. I talked to one this morning who were very big in the business then. Not very big. They were starting out in the business. And I knew the risk, but... Uh, I did what I wanted to. I, and then I did what took less discipline, less dedication to craft. Do you think you could have been a big time star if you uh, studied hard? I think harder? I could have had a, a career. Could I have been a big star? I don't know. But I think I could have been a working actor. Yeah, I was. Well, I, I was. Yeah, I think I could have developed and I could have done, I could have made a living at it. Yeah. And uh, I wish I had. Oh yeah, really? Yeah. So I never had any doubts or recriminations during my extraordinary career, but I do now. It's not active, I don't beat myself up for it. But <clears throat> what I did, and I understand what I did in adult films, I may be like among the two or three most respected directors in adult films ever. It's, 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 yes, it's always my ego talking, but this is for sure. I mean, if you list the best films of all time, I've got half of them. The films that were screenplays, films that could be somehow watched as a real movie. If that has any value to it, I did more of those than anyone. It was what I wanted to do, and for that, I guess I can I can be very proud. I li I wanted to lift people's sexual consciousness so that when they watched an erotic entertainment, it was not just about jacking off. 
It was about you were emotionally involved, you were involved in the story, the relationships, and the sex that would come as a result of that would be better. It's just like having a relationship with, it was funny, it was the opposite of my private life. You know, for most people, having a relationship with a woman, not most people, a lot of people, having a relationship with a woman makes the sex better. That's how I try to create my movies, but not in my private life, you know. It wasn't good, no? No, what's the bother with the relationship? <laughs> yeah. But it's hard accomplishment to hold up to people now. You know, a lot, in most crowds, unless they know me, when I would bring that up, they, Come on, dude, you're a pornographer. Just own it. You're a pornographer. People jacked off to your shit. It's, no, it's okay, Philip, PT. It's okay. But no big deal. Get off your fucking high horse. No big fucking deal. Okay, you're a pornographer. That's, uh, we don't hate you for it. Okay. That's not enough for me. You know, I love, I like to be respected, even revered for what I did. It was the best in the, one of the best in the world. Man. But most people who aren't really familiar with pornography don't feel that way. They think it's all emperor's clothes bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that I, so now I don't have any professional life like that. I never, I, I couldn't spend another day on, on a movie, X-rated movie set, no matter what you paid me. Would never do it. I don't have anything. The, the community that I was involved with is gone. I, it's just something I did. I don't have too much to do with it anymore. It's not. I'm not ashamed. It's just not worthwhile. It's not something that's. If I had a mainstream career, I could still be doing it. I would have a whole different set of contacts and experiences and, and, and reactions from people. If that matters, I don't care about that much. If I could snap my fingers and start over again, I don't think I would have gone into X-rated movies. But you know how much that type of thinking is worth? Nothing. Oh, it might hurt your heart a little bit sometimes. Hurts it a little bit. I made a lot of money. That helps it a lot. Absolutely. Because I'm financially well set up because of my work. That helps immensely. If I had done everything I did and was still a poor schmuck like half the people we've talked about, I'd really feel stupid. Yeah. Wouldn't you? If you did it, went through all the things you went through and then there were didn't have a pot to piss in, you'd feel pretty stupid. Yeah, well, I mean, so. it's, it's easy, that it, it can happen very easy. So yeah, um, I feel real stupid. I haven't always made the best choices myself, but you know, I keep going. But, um, so back to that um, thousand dollars a day, you're our, so, you know, for me, it, it took time to work my way up to a, a higher um, level of porn, you know? acting or whatever, performing. But for you, you could perform naturally because there was no Viagra, which, you know, in my head, in my brain, sometimes being a good performer is a skill, you know? I, I always thought it was a skill and it's not easy to do. You mean sexually? Sexually. Yeah. It, it came natural to you? Sure. Easy? Easy. Yeah. It didn't come easy to you, it certainly seemed to. Well, I mean, I had the focus. Of the, you know, I used to do three or four scenes a day, so. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, but I never did three or four scenes. I did one scene a day. I wouldn't even do two. <laughs> yeah. No. No. But I wasn't hired for my fucking. I, I wasn't. I was good, but I was hired because I tried. I, I never. I, 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 when I. To make a thousand a day, you had a be the star of the movie too, so I was hired for my acting. But you had to do both. Yeah, it was still, it was still I guess, I don't know, you know, I wasn't there, but for me, when I got in the business, it was 
mysterious and it was exciting and there was pressure too. Working for, um, for you always made it fairly unpressurable. Truthfully, when I worked for you, I remember the first thing I did for you was me, Buck Adams, and Victoria Paris out near that bridge out in the countryside. And, uh, you know, I didn't feel too much pressure compared to John Leslie. I felt a lot of pressure, oh. you know, working for him. He was a very wonderful well, person. He did great stuff. Yeah. He was one of the best ever. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, John, well, I thought John made some of the best porno movies ever. His the sexual tension that he would put into the scene, the way he'd stage it. He was amazing. As a director, as an actor too, but as a director, he was even better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as an actor, he's the top guy at this point in time when you come around, or who is, who, yeah. Jamie Gillis or you? Jamie. Jamie's number one? Jamie was number one, John was number two, and then I was three with probably some other people, Eric Edwards, Maybe Randy West, a couple people out in New York, but Jamie was clearly number one. Really? Yeah. I love. He's a crazy guy, huh? Yeah. Was he as wild as you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I spoke to him numerous times, right? Yeah. We did a scene together one time for Alex, and I kept saying, calling him Pop. He got pissed off at me, <laughs> but he was always so uh, interesting to talk to. Yeah. You know, so he was number one by far, huh? Or not by far, but. He was number one. But, but so uh, John Holmes was not really part of that mix. Well, he was a different. Holmes was a a power hitter. Uh, you know, okay. Holmes is a different thing. But Holmes didn't have the soul that Jamie had. Holmes just had a great big dick. You know, Jamie had the soul of a pervert. <laughs> He's a oh, a fucking pervert, absolutely. <laughs> Even when he wasn't doing anything, but fucking a beautiful woman, it's, he, he had the ability to make it seem nasty, wrong. He was great, huh? Yeah. One time, yeah, because Joey, you know, I talked to Joey a lot, right? Yeah. Joey Silvera. And Joey said, yeah, Jamie was unbelievable. He said he had a pair of panties he would hold when he got on the airplane, black girl's panties, and sniff them to calm him down. Oh. <laughs> so he was just a wild guy, right? But then... Joey also said about you, he said, I never seen a guy ever be so high and can perform. Paul Thomas is incredible. He could do shit, nobody could do that. He said he could be high all the time. <laughs> you were high on the set? Cocaine. Uh, snorting? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's well, amazing, right? I mean, but I'd have to, I, it wouldn't come, I didn't do cocaine all day. I was never addicted to it, but I never did it every day. But before I would do my scene, I would do cocaine, often. Not all the time, often. And then I would have a window. You've done cocaine, you know. And then there'd be a window in which I had to do my performance, in which I was amazing, because the coke was working. I was, get out of my fucking way, I was amazing. But then if it didn't fall within that window... <laughs> 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 that's the, that's no good. Yeah, so the directors knew. In fact, one of them, we used to call out, okay, Tootski time. And I, and I went in the bathroom many times at Holmes. We do cocaine right before the scene. Co Holmes is absolutely into the same. So Holmes can perform too with coke? Yeah. Wow. Now that, yeah, and after a while, not without it. Wow. I can never do something like that. I mean, really, there's no way in hell I can yeah. perform. It's not healthy. I, I mean, it's not a good thing. So, but you say you had a window, an hour, two hour window, and then that was it? You're going down? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going down. How many times that happened when you went down? Not often. Not often? No. Five, a handful? Not many. I wouldn't let it. Yeah. I'd take over. You controlled? I'd take over the whole fucking set. You know, yeah, yeah it would, but it happened, sure. So, was it exciting for you to be in this film world of, you know, this sex, drugs, rock and roll? I mean, there's you in film. I mean, how, how did it feel to you when you, I mean, you're a star at the beginning. You're, you're telling me right away. I 
I always felt <clears throat> I was a little bit too good for it. I always felt that I was uh, a little bit too uh, aristocratic, educated, privileged, and that because I was regarded as one of the very best that I should have been, I didn't have much time for anybody who didn't regard me as I regarded myself. So while it was cool, because everyone around had told me it was cool, I always knew that it was weird to be international X-rated screen star Paul Thomas. It was weird. It's weird. It's weird now. But why? Why is it weird? Because you're celebrated for. Because. If we were with a bunch of people, right, there's some of my films that I could put on with a mixed crowd right here, right now, and the best definition possible, the best, and you go, oh, wow, that's good. And we could sit it and watch it, and even when, the, even when the sex came, but even in those films, the best ones, like the masseuse, you know, with Jenna, when the sex came, it's extreme. And it, was, it, it gets boring. The sex, when the sex comes, and those are the best, they could pass muster, but most of the work, it's stupid, it's sex. What, what you put on one of your scenes, you, did a, you were one of the best fuckers around, but if you put that scene on and you watch with other people, it's not like it's bad. It's not like it's evil. It's not, but it's just, okay, so what? I'm fucking on screen, big fucking deal. It's interesting to begin with, you go in the first couple strokes, it's exciting to you, to the people watching it, but then, oh, it's a big fucking deal. This is what I'm celebrating? This is what made me so rich and famous? That's stupid. You don't feel that way when you watch your scenes with with, I don't mean when you're whacking off to it, but I mean with people and you're showing them something. This is, I'm really proud of this. I'm really proud of this. And you put on a scene of yourself fucking the hell out of some girl. It's even when it's not a judgmental person, when it's an accepting person, it's okay. But it's like, yeah, I, it's I, not like you're playing of Gone with the Wind. It's not like you're presenting them with a real piece of art. It's not like you're showing a real accomplishment. You were one of the best fuckers around. So what? <laughs> you're fucking people. I was one of the best porno stars around. So what? I'm fucking people. Nothing to be ashamed of, but also nothing to be so goddamn proud of. We're just lucky. We're in the right place at the right time. We did the right thing. We made a lot of money. It's cool. Like we were the best bagger at the grocery store, the best... You know what I mean? And I, I'm not suggesting being ashamed of it for a second. I'm just suggesting it's not that cool. Well, I, I think it's cool. I have okay. to disagree with you a little bit. Let me well, give we, you my point of view. we are fundamentally different, but... Yeah, we're, we grew up a little different. I grew up working in a mine when I was six years old, an open pit mine in Death Valley, 120 oh degrees. I worked in tanks inside tanks with soda, salt cake, limestone, burning holes in my feet when I'm 14. It's 180 degrees inside those tanks. Oy. And, um, you know, I grew up working. I grew up, you know, while I had a good mind, a good brain, I could add and do uh, algebra in, by fifth grade. I, I, still, I still can't do algebra, yeah. I still did was in, in the limelight of uh, easiness. You know, uh, you know uh, posh, this and posh, that. My father had money, but I had to work for every penny I ever got. No money ever. So, so what I'm saying is, from graduating from a greasy life, but at the end I was a mechanic. Okay. And a deep, working on these started breaking my hands all day long. You know, in the hot sun. No respect, no love, no appreciation for anything you do. And I would work 24-hour shifts sometimes. And then going from that to all this beauty, and I loved women, you know, the beautiful 
girls, I was looking at all the movies that I could because it was hard to get in the 80s. You know, I came in in the 80s, late 80s. But um, to graduate from breaking your hands with no love to being appreciated for being a great fucker, you know. And I, and one of the things I thought about is I want to be one of the best fuckers or the best, you know. And I always tried to make my scenes the best I could make them. And that was an accomplishment. For some reason, the acting. I, and, you, and you were. And, and you were. And you were. And so what? You're fucking someone. Anybody can do it. Now, I don't mean anybody can fuck as long as you. Everyone doesn't have a dick as big as you or as big as mine. But so what? You, I can go out in the street right now. You were fucking. Any, not anybody. A lot of people can do it. A whole mm -hmm. lot of people. So when I'm, and I feel this strongly, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's also nothing to be that fucking proud of. Good. You're a bad good supermarket. You're a fuck good. You're fucking good, TT boy, Paul Thomas, John. You're fucking good and you're good at it. Good for you. But you're not, you're not presenting a piece of art, a piece of music. You're not presenting a creating something wonderful that everyone out, millions of, you're not, no, you're just, you're catering, I, I, this is how I feel. Mm -hmm. You're catering to a very low common denominator, one that many, many people can do and it's just fine. And the reason you're able to do it, I don't mean to burst anybody's, I don't care when the bubbles I burst. The reason one is able to do it, first of all, you have to have the ability, the physical ability to do it, but you also have to be in the mindset that I mean, to most people, to fuck in front of other people, it's embarrassing. It's 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 personal. You don't want to do it. It's it's it is weird. Yeah. TT, it's weird. Not by no stretch. I've never thought it's bad. Uh -huh. But to do it is one thing. To get paid for it is great. But to hold it out there is a beacon of an accomplishment is something that I don't buy. Uh, uh, John Leslie, when I would watch, admired him greatly. Jimmy Gillis, admired him greatly. They brought an artistry and a personality to the, but they're fucking, just fucking? Okay, so what, John? You're fucking, you come all over our tits. You kept it up, but so what? That's not what you're to be proud of, John. That's just what keeps you in the, it's, it's the lighting or the, the way you say the dialogue. This is, there's an art. There. I, I guess I looked at it like it was a skill, it was a hard... Ab absolutely, yeah. a skill. I guess that's the difference I'm saying. It's, it's a skill as opposed to an art. Yeah, uh, but but then, if you look at let's have a comparison here, all right? You have a wonderful boxer. He's very skilled, and sometimes the way he orchestrates a setup to pull somebody into a trap or you know counter so perfectly is artistic. It's so beautiful from the eye of certain beholders. Right. Because it's so hard to do all that and to make it happen and create it. So when you're, I thought a little bit, when you're creating a beautiful scene, it's not everybody can do it in front okay. of people. It's very difficult. And if you make something beautiful and all the chemistry and you bring out all the emotion out of the, your partner and it's a, a symphony of love and, and um, um, happiness and you know energy and well, all that together, I think that's a little artistic. Oh, okay. I will give you that. I just don't think it's that. I understand. I, I don't. I, I think it's far more common mm -hmm. than Canelo, you know, or Muhammad Ali, you know, or any really good boxer. There's not a whole lot of people that can do that. There's a whole lot of people. Mm. 
Really? You uh, really think well, so? I, no, you, you're right, you're right, because it's not. If they, and there never were. Take away rag or take away whatever they do. Okay, well, I can think what I mean to watch it. You've watched scenes of yours, and yeah. they might be 25 minutes long. No, no, no one, don't come, unless you, oh, yeah, yeah. you can't watch that whole thing. Only if you love the girl and you want to see the girl, of course, but... Yeah, that's, it's good. that's what I mean. It's good the length that we would have to do the scenes and how long we would have to hold the scenes on camera, on the screen. I thought it was a... It served the purposes of having sex or masturbation. You might want to watch it that long, but if you're watching my best movies ever, The Devil and Miss Jones, and you're watching it and not having sex, it's tough to watch. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, not totally, but you're at a different point of view at this this time, I think. Well, before, your point of view was not like this. Right? Because you loved to watch in the cinema. You but I was in it. I was getting the physical sensations of... No, when you went to the, to the theater? Yeah, but then too. I was masturbating. Since I was done masturbating, I don't want to watch it anymore. Yeah. Uh, right, right. No, I understand. Totally. I was saying similar. But I was... You know, um, I, I just tend to think aroused. that I, particularly me perhaps, because I was so awarded, I was so lauded as being so big creative person, I tend to overdo it. Okay, but, <sighs> but the last, uh, we'll, we'll, fit, we'll move on, but the last part, a little bit you said, not everybody can do it. No. It is not an easy job, no. so it takes focus, concentration, and natural physical ability. Yes. So. In one way or another, it can be artistic because only certain people have those the brain to do certain things. And when they do it, directing or they make a, a piece of art, that is what they can do, like you said earlier, when you were um, not great at mechanics, but you're good at, you know, understanding language. So it can be doing language correctly. Writing is beautiful art sometimes. It takes focus, energy. But anyways, let's move on from there. I'm always interested in the old days, a little nostalgia about, you know, the business. Because I was a big fan. I was a fan of yours, too. I was, you know, I said, that guy's got something, he's cool, something. I didn't like everybody, believe me. And I was a little Mark Wallace, I wanted to beat up for some reason. <laughs> right? Anyway, so, you know, there's some guys, you know, Tom, I don't care, Peter North, you, John Leslie, and Jamie Gillis. And we're cool. I thought Rand West was all right, too. He's cool. And Joey seemed all right. But other guys, I didn't like too much. But anyways, you know, in those, those, that era. Okay, so here you are, the star. You're working. Do you feel like you want to compete? Are you competitive against John Leslie and Jamie Gillis? Are you, is there a little machismo going on there? Anything like that? Yeah. No? No. He's too nice of a guy. He's a very nice person. We were such different types, first of all. Yeah, but you're very calm. Yeah, you know, even if it was, we're yeah. in mainstream movies, the three of us are much different types. Uh -huh. right. uh, That's true. You have different looks and John was a very uh, intense guy. He was unique. Yeah. I would say was, very he, Italian. And I'm not picking on the Italians. Uh, <laughs> he was very Italian. Yeah. Well you and, and John gave me some of my first jobs and I appreciate it. You know? You were great. I was great. Yeah, yeah. T. Where did you get the name T. T. Boy? Because I went by Troy. Okay. Right. And people used to call me Troy Boy. Okay. And then one time I was, and I've said this before on my show. One time I was, I had left home when I was a kid, 15 years old. I just said, "Fuck it, I'm out of here." Right. <laughs> there was yeah. rough times, you know what I mean? And I um, was in Tombstone, Arizona, because I like the old West, and sometimes think I was a gunslinger. And I said, if I was a in the Old West, I would be Billy the Kid. No, I'd be Troy the Boy. All right. That's it. That's my gunslinger name. I thought you'd got it from Boy George. <laughs> no, man. I was a gunslinger, man. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes you got to look at this business. You know, it's like we are gunslingers. You know, as an actor, you're a gunslinger. Like, you know, you're here to, you know, sling. Anyways, how'd you get Paul Thomas? Um... I wanted to keep my initials for some reason, PT. I was going to call myself Philip Thomas. 
But there was an actor at the time named Philip Michael Thomas who was in... Am I right? Yeah. Who happened to be dating Kay Parker. Wow. Yeah. And uh, in deference to him, I cut out the Michael. Okay. I made it Paul Thomas. What, what actresses, you know, because I was a fan of a lot of actresses, you know, porn stars. Which ones did you like in those days? Which ones you were a fan of? When I was working or watching? Before and while you're working. When I was watching, nobody in particular. I remember Renee Bond, great round ass, little round ass, love it. But um, a lot of the films were done in New York, so there was this, uh, I don't remember the names of actresses. How about your time? When I was working, well, um, there was Annette Haven, Leslie Bouvet, you know who that is? Uh, yeah, I heard the name for sure. Leslie, oh, so she was unbelievable. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question about that, because I have certain ideas for unbelievable, and everybody's ideas are different. What makes a girl unbelievable for you? Intelligence. Chemistry, green eyes, and a round ass. Uh, does the quality of the pussy do anything for you? Not particularly. What? I'm, I'm done. <clears throat> I'm getting hoarse. I'm okay. getting tired. Uh, so, of course, thank you very much, and hopefully you'll have me back. Yes, I, 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 it's much better in, in sections. Yeah. Okay. Whatever you like. I, I appreciate you giving me the time. Um, you're welcome. <laughs>